in terms of the dance that was in Tibet, was there a particular form that was used by the lamas uh, or, or the people? I, I'm, um, was dance ever used by the common practitioners as a form of meditation, or was it was it more so um, used by the, the, the lamas as displays of protector beings? Could you speak a little bit more about the specific types of dance that existed in Tibet? Well, in India, dance was used as part of several tantric traditions, certainly connected to chakra sambara. And a lot of Tibetan Buddhist lineages come into Tibet from Nepal and from the Nawar Buddhists of the Kathmandu Valley, which is, you know, Buddha was born just a few hundred miles from the Kathmandu Valley. If you travel over the mountains, if you come motorcycling with me in Nepal this autumn, we can rent motorbikes in uh, Kathmandu and hop on a southwest route and get down to Lumbini, Buddha's birthplace, in about six or eight hours of motorbiking. I'd love and, that. Uh, <laughs> I used to do that at the end of every pilgrimage to Tibet. Uh, anyone who wanted to uh, rent little motorbikes, you know, the 100 cc, 150 cc, is quite easy to drive and fairly safe on those narrow roads, easy, not heavy, so easy to start or stop kind of quickly and all that. But uh, um, so Buddha was born in Nepal, not far from the Kathmandu Valley, I mean, over the mountain range, obviously, down on the plains, but southwest of Kathmandu by, I don't know, six, eight hours drive, a half hour flight, actually, <laughs> the airplane flight does it, <coughs> and probably 250 BC or something, Emperor Ashok, who became, you could say, the unifier of India, the first unifier of India, as a kingdom or as a political entity in about 250 BC sent one of his daughters to Kathmandu to establish temples and uh, Buddhist temples and Buddhist stupas and so forth. So the Kathmandu Valley culture of Buddhism is very, very ancient. And they still have a very active form of doing of, of tantric dance associated uh, a lot of it associated with the so-called kriya tantras so manjusri dance and uh, various yogini dances and so forth and those undoubtedly influenced tibet and in tibet uh, the form of t monastic dances are chum and when we say monasteries it's not always only celibate monks like we sort of have that sense in the West, I think, because of Cath calling Catholic celibates, calling them monks. You know, some monasteries in Tibet were not exclusively celibate. It was an option. You could or could not as you wished. And as your finances would allow, because as everyone knows, it's cheaper to be celibate than to be non-celibate. <laughs> 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 it's, it's a big it's a big money saver. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <clears throat> so a lot of the uh, uh, chum or lama dances were actually, I think, connected to the Kali tradition in India. And if you go around, if you travel around India, you still see like Kali and Shiva dances and the various temples. A lot of these are seasonal things. You could say seasonal transitions rather than actual meditative training as such. They're really conducted as a kind of a celebration of moving from one season to another or a particular period astrological or astro, astro, astronomical. <laughs> Although sometimes we just use that word astronomical to mean big, but here meaning actually astronomical <laughs> time of, of great danger or transition. So they were kind of ways of connecting, bringing heaven and earth together, I think, into a harmony um, based on a very ancient idea of the innate goodness of being and uh, man's or humanity's ability to 
play a role in that relationship between heaven and earth, uh, largely through dance and sacred celebration. So for instance, the, the last day of the year, the night before New Year Day, traditionally they do a dance called Torgya, where they, it's connected to a tantric cycle known as uh, Dorji Purpa or Vajrakiliya in Sanskrit, where they wear a big black hat outfit and dance with a big huge dagger and they create a kind of a ghost trap, you could say. In Tibetan is de, the word for it is de. It's like a big thread cross, an eye of God, uh, similar to the eye of God made by Southwest Indian natives in their sacred rituals in olden days. Of course, uh, the white people in America picked up on those thread crosses, not as sacred ritual, but as kind of a way to have entertaining kids and making cute little kite looking things with colored threads. But in ancient times, coming from Central Asia, when our native North Americans migrated from there 13,000 BC, 25,000 BC, I think the last uh, mass migration was 8,000 BC, that kind of idea of this thread cross as a kind of an energy trap, I think native North Americans call them like dream catchers. <laughs> yeah. A way of filling and clarifying your energies. Uh, for, ritually, for when you have a lot of disturbing dreams and difficulties in your life and a way of purifying those energies. So the day mm -hmm. be, last day of the new year, they do a big Lama dance uh, in accordance with the Vajrakiliya Tantra, Doshya Purpa Tantra, and call all of the negative energy into, a, you could say, one of these eye of God du, or dream catchers. And all the negative energy from the, from the year is carried into it. And then later, in a ritual dance site, it's sort of carried out and you dance around the courtyard with it and throw it into a huge bonfire. And this way you get rid of all, everyone thinks, okay, last year I may have robbed a few banks and murdered a few traveling Chinese people or whatever. <laughs> No, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> Nothing so dramatic, but I may have, you know, um, punched my nose because he, he let his horse, you know, get into my barley field, or I may have insulted one of my kids or, you know, had some unpleasant dispute with my in-laws or something. Sort of one would think of all the sort of negative energy residual from that year that hasn't been cleared and sort of make, like in the West, we make a New Year's resolution. But there they sort of think of the old year and they think of everything negative from that year. I'm th putting it in this sacrificial offering, this dream catcher. It's catching all the bad energies of my bad behavior dreams, you could say. <laughs> and then ritually with mantra and singing and chanting and whatnot, it's carried and thrown into the bonfire and the next day you know the Dalai Lama comes out at three o'clock or four o'clock under the roof of the temple or if you're in a different valley the high lama of that temple comes out and gives a new year blessing and they do auspicious prayers for the whole year and ask everyone to you know let bygones be bygones and try to begin the new year on as positive a note as possible so that's a very common dance that's done once every year by every monastery in Tibet, I think. I don't know, I couldn't say everyone, but uh, very widely, wild, widely uh, practiced. And then there are various occasions, like Nyingmas love to do the dance of the eight Guru Rinpoche's or the eight, the eight uh, emanations of Guru Rinpoche, each of which sort of is a a chap eight chapters in his life, you could say, sort of how Buddhism came to Tibet and his work in bringing Buddhism to Tibet and creating the sort of style that Tibetan Buddhism was to achieve over the centuries to follow. And all kinds of um, Lama dances for particular occasions. They also do Lama dances, for instance, in exorcism. When I was in Amsala, I would 
uh, I was uh, had a very close friendship with the Dalai Lama's rainmaker, a rain stopper. Uh, so the Lama, who ritualistically would be asked to stop the rain if Dalai Lama was giving a teaching in a cool place and make a little bit of sprinkle of rain if it was in a hot, dusty place to cool it down. But he made the majority of his income not from rainmaking, rain stopping, although he did okay with that, but as an exorcist and as a ritual healer. And some of the healing activities are done with well, the means of dance. And then in the Chud tradition, the so-called cutting, cutting out of ego, Shiche Sarchud is a longer name for it in Tibetan, where they use a very big, large drum and boom, boom, human thigh bone trumpet. <laughs> and they often do that with dance while meditating. And uh, I've seen all of those kind of dances performed. Another very interesting one is at the time of a funeral rite, when someone's body is going to be cut up and offered to the vultures, sometimes four chidpas will be invited to do a sacred dance for about an hour in which the soul of that person is invited to sort of manifest and watch the dance and learn the four basic instructions of the Chud practitioner, which is be joyful like the tiger and be calm like a wise old grandma. <laughs> uh, be, be, be fluid like the snake and uh, be celebratory like a dance, dancing angel or angelette. <laughs> so they have four dancers doing the chud dance with the thigh, human thigh bone trumpet and the chumdar and chanting and dancing as a kind of a prelude to the actual offering of the body, the corpse to the birds and summoning the consciousness and asking them to get ready and say, you know, you're dead. And, time to move on and uh, whether you like it or not, that's where it's how things are and uh, there's your body. And now it's, uh, you ate various things all your life, including meat. So now we're gonna offer your body to the greatest of the meat eaters, the, the, the vulture, which in, in Tibet was a, almost like a condor, like, sort of like a super eagle. And, uh, I've attended some of those in Tibet also, them in the very, very amazing, efficient, amazingly efficient ways of disposing of a, of a card, cardiver, <laughs> of a corpse. Yeah. And also very auspicious because the last person's very last act is an act of generosity to the birds. And the birds are very happy because humans taste quite good, especially after they're dead. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so the birds all look very happy with the dance and they sit patiently through the dance. I'm not sure if they really like it that much. They're probably hoping, hurry up guys. Right. My tummy's rumbling. <laughs> right. But uh, in the, some traditions, dance as a meditative situation is there. But I think that's more influenced in the, the, that's more in the last couple of hundred years and it is older than that. Yeah, but it was very big in tantric Buddhism in India, which is a warm climate and therefore such things are uh, more easy to do and a very high you know, population. So easier to maintain those traditions. I know Namkan Norbu, for instance, uh, the Tibetan Lama who lived in, in Italy, most of his adult life after being in India, Dalai Lama sent him to Italy to help uh, Professor Tucci there with his work on Tibetan studies. And Namkan Orba went on to set up a string of centers around the world and became, I would say, one of the probably five most influential Dzogchen teachers in the West. And uh, he teaches some sort of mindfulness Dakini dances to some of his students to do while they're meditating. And that's based on the term of tradition in Tibet, so from a tradition in Tibet. But from my experience, 
variants. Uh, the Tibetans more looked upon uh, art, both as visual art, painting and statuary, and also chanting the musical arts as the primary form of meditative, using art for meditative purposes. And the Lama dances, the Chum, more used as a way of kind of making great transitions from one situation to another. Like for instance, if this were Tibet with the COVID virus, the China virus, you'd probably have local monasteries out doing Paldan Lamo dances, because Paldan Lamo is the one who can control contagious diseases. Mm. And there's many wonderful dances associated with Paldan Lamo, mm. one of the great uh, female Dharma palas in Tibet. Lama Glenn, I'm reading um, uh, the autobiography of Jamyam Kensi Choki Lodro right now, and uh, most, multiple times in there, there's reference either to him or some other great teachers having a spontaneous dance uh, where there, there's some realization they're having or there's some experience that causes them to have a spontaneous dance, or there's reference to the Dakinis, these beings, uh, maybe in the air or in the sky dancing. Um, it, would you speak a little more about is, what is the relate? What is a spontaneous dance reference? Why is it arising? Why does it come as dance? Um, <laughs> well, I think you know the the toku, the tokus and the, the lamas, the monks, the nuns, the, the yogis and yoginis. They will be around dance. Uh, from the time of their childhood. I mean, even like in every village in Tibet, there's four or five occasions a year when you have these all day dances, sometimes for three, four days at an end. Everyone comes at five or six in the morning and stays till five or six in the evening. Generally, you know, chewing on snacks during it, the, the, the villagers and sipping wine and picnicking and all that, you know, enjoying the enjoying the festivity and the sort of community bonding, if you will. So everyone has that. But of course, um, there's all of these in tantric Buddhism, especially in the Dakini Tantras, the female Tantras like Chakrasambara, Hebhajra, and so forth. The idea of dance as a celebration of enlightenment is uh, ubiquitous in the poetry of India and Tibet, and also in the liturgical literature which is chanted like for instance the great Mongolian Lama of the Galupa school who was the guru to the Manchu Mongol emperors or conquerors of China wrote a wonderful song ah, la, 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 oh, ah, he, ah, ah, ra, li, oh. you know people will chant that and then in the verses, uh, it'll mention the great dance of the consort and the romantic embrace and the great bliss of embracing the consort. So it's very common, I think, for mystical, mystical peoples to refer to that. So for instance, the second Dalai Lama, in one of his poems, he's in retreat and he has a great epiphany and he writes, just think, thinking of the greatness of Lama Sankapa, who is the guru of the first Dalai Lama, the founder of the Dalai Lama school, and of the great lineage masters, moves my heart with gladness, and it causes me to jump up and swoon and move my feet to and fro and dance. It's the ecstasy of the power of the lineage. The energies just flow through me. <laughs> So he just basically, in the middle of comp composing this poem, jumps up and starts dancing and doing, doing the Dakini dance with la, 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 ho, ha, hi, ha, ha, ra, li, ho. <laughs> and uh, we see that in poems by the seventh Dalai Lama, the fifth Dalai Lama. So that's a very kind of common phenomena where sort of the ecstasy of a meditation experience will be will be expressed through just basically jumping up and dancing mm 
And one of my own great gurus, uh, who is Damalobja Rinpoche, he was, uh, he was the, guru, the main guru of the Kimji Gelek Rinpoche, who his center is in Ann, Ann Arbor, Detroit. But uh, when he, as a young man, was being given, he and some of the other high tokus were being given instruction by Ling Rinpoche, who was you know, Dalama's great guru, on how to make the Yamantaka San Mandala. And they worked for several days to get it ready, and Ling Rinpoche is, uh, got the whole thing going. And then when, the, when it's finished, Ling Rinpoche looks at it, and he's a young man, maybe 30 years old, and those tokus are maybe, you know, 10, 12 or 15 or something. He's just having, he looks at it and says, oh, a work of art, absolutely perfect. And he takes two steps back and then jumps on top of the table, on top of the whole San Mandala and does the Yamantaka dance right on top of all the sand mandala. <laughs> and of course, all the young tukus have just spent a week making this, painstakingly making this picture perfect sand mandalas. See the whole sort of mandala just go up in dust and smoke as he, as he dances to and fro in joy. <laughs> But of course, as you know, you've probably seen San Mandalas made by Lamas on tour, and usually at the end of them, they're swept up and put into the river for, for blessing. Mm -hmm. So I think Ling Rinpoche was saying, part of that blessing is the celebration of ecstasy of the, the Tantric Mandala as expressed through, through dance and celebration. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mm -hmm. I had a, another topic I wanted to ask you about, which is the Medicine Buddha, um, which has recently resurfaced to my attention. Um, and then uh, Jewel Hart is teaching a demo. Rinpoche. Jewel Hart is just starting to teach again on the Medicine Buddha this coming Friday. I was hoping you could share a little bit about the meaning of the mantra. I've been asking several different people. Um, I've heard like two specific variations, Teata Om Bakanji Bakanji Maha Bakanji Raja Samogati Soha. And then one where there's two Bakanjis after Maha Bakanji. <laughs> and then I well, remember. Mm -hmm. Tibetans say Bekanze. Bekanze. Om Bekanze Bekanze Maha Bekanze Raja Samogati Soha. And uh, sometimes, and uh, Tadyata is just like, uh, uh, when the Beatles sing one, two, three, four, she was just 17. So Tajata is just sort of saying, here it comes, get ready. Okay. <laughs> That's often done in group chanting. You know, so the Unze will go Tajata, like that. And then he'll start with whatever is the mantra. So I first heard that with Lama Tupin Yeshe, the founder of the FBMT group of Buddhist centers, wonderful, wonderful um, Sarah J. Monk, who was really a living Mahasiddha. He, he, his energy was so explosive and his way of communicating enlightenment, just so direct, just amazing. But I walked in and sat down and he started, And when he started that, uh, there were about 30 of us sitting in the Tibetan library teaching room in the Dharamsala where Dalai Lama had uh, set up a school for Westerners. So this was maybe, maybe the autumn of 72 or maybe the autumn of 73, I don't remember. But uh, anyway, long time, almost 50 years ago. And when he started chanting, suddenly the building was hit by an earthquake. And Dharamsala has three or four earthquakes a year. So I thought, oh my gosh, earthquake. And I thought, oh, and it, you know, I grew up in the East Coast, and earthquake, the church of India by Tibetans who weren't used to building with cement. I thought, oh my God, we're all going to be crushed to death. I better, like, you know, get out of here. And, I, and then I look around and I notice nobody else is panicking at all. I thought, oh, dang, what a cool bunch of cucumbers these guys are. Sit through an earthquake without moving, real advanced meditators. 
And I rolled my eyes or cast my eye over toward the altar where Tibetans always keep water, water bowls filled to the brim with water and the water wasn't moving. So I knew at that time that I was the only one experiencing the earthquake. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> so, I look, so I look back at Lama Yeshe and he sort of goes like this. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yo. <laughs> finishes chanting, he looks at me and goes, yes, dear. <laughs> I was often done in group settings as kind of a introduction, like a, a timing to help people come in on the right time and on the right note and to set, you know, the, to set the melody and the, and the pitch, you could say. The actual mantra, Om Muni Muni Maha Muni Ye Sohar, with the medicine Buddha, Om Bikans and Bikans and Maha Bikans and Ranza Samukati Soha. And some people throw in an extra Bikans, Om Bikans and Maha Bikans and Bikans and Ranza Samukati Soha. And the meaning of the mantra is given different uh, interpretations in different traditions. So one I personally like, Bekanze is uh, referring to Bhai Jaguru, uh, the great healing healing master. Uh, great healing, Bekanze. Uh, healing, healing, Maha Bekanze. Great healing, healing. King of healing. So it's given five kind of levels of healing, you could say. And that can be taken in different directions as an explanation of meaning or given some sort of philosophical or se sequential meaning. And different traditions uh, do that with it. Um, and the first healing is a kind of a feeling of our own positive mind, you could say. The feeling that our own strength, our own ability to take care of our own business. <laughs> I think one of the problems humans have is they're always looking for help. They often tend to forget that they are their own best helper. What's the expression we have in Christianity? God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> so in the, one of the practices, like with Amitaya's healing, which is one of the healing main healing forms in Tibet, one sends out lights from one's heart and one thinks any negative energy I've lost, any self-confidence and whatever, any positive feeling and positive emotions I've lost through negative encounters with others and scarring encounters with others, I send that out and I pull that back and I reclaim my natural birthright of pure energy and pure confidence. So the first becomes, you could say, refers to that and the second is the healing of the elements of the body, earth, water, fire, air. Um, in other words, everything solid about the body, all the solid things we eat and the liquid things we drink and the sunshine that we get <laughs> and the air we breathe and the way these four elements come together within our body like four snakes in a barrel. <laughs> if we can keep the four snakes happy and not fighting with each other, we have perfect health. If those four snakes start to fight with each other, you've got a big problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. You got calcification of the bones and the, you know, clogging of the arteries. <laughs> mm. A wheezy breathing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But when the four elements are in perfect balance, then the, the four snakes in the barrel are there just taking a nice, happy, little friendly snooze together and keeping each other warm with the warmth of their, <laughs> mm. the bodies of the others. And third, healing our worldly powers, you could say. Because it becomes a ma becomes a how to be successful in this life of ours. Uh, how to be successful with other human beings, how to be successful with other animals and fishes and butterflies, how to be successful with nature, have a happy, healthy relationship in that. So how to be successful in terms of our artistic qualities, our artistic archetype or instinct, if you will, our creative instinct. How to be successful in our career or our job choice or whatever you want to call it. How to be successful in our 
uh, conflicts with others. In other words, to have, because uh, when you live in this world, there's always conflicts with others. They're inevitable. You know, we fight with uh, ants over where we get to build our house and the termites, whether they get to eat our house or not. And we fight with the rodents and the cockroaches, whether they get to invade our kitchens. And, mm -hmm. You know, we fight with the thunderstorms and the tornadoes and the hurricanes. <laughs> we have a, a, a potential for conflict in every relationship with everything animate and inanimate. And uh, having successful conflict, conflict uh, solution <laughs> tools is a kind of a healing, you could say. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have that, then we're, all, we're always unhappy and we're always in a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Complaining about the weather, complaining about the neighbors, complaining about, you know, whatever. And uh, then the fourth one um, is the healing of our inner spiritual life. You know, how to heal our compassion, make our compassion equal to the compassion of Christ, to the compassion of a Buddha, the compassion of a Bodhisattva. How to make our wisdom uh, the wisdom of, what is it, Solomon? Was he the wise guy? I can't remember mm -hmm. which wise guy in the Old Testament. Solomon? Yeah, yeah. He seemed a little too radical to me by wanting to cut the baby in half. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Abraham and Solomon, I think. The, then when the, wrong, when, the wrong one, when the wrong one, who wasn't the mother, said, oh, no, no, that's going too far. She can have it. He mistakenly said, oh, then you must be the real mother, not knowing that she just didn't have the grit to hang in <laughs> yes. and test his life. Anyway, the wisdom of Solomon in Buddhism, we say wisdom of Manjushri, the Buddha of wisdom, or the Buddha symbolizing wisdom of the infinity of being expressed in perfect harmony with the, with the form is emptiness, emptiness is form, you could say, oh, what's going on in our life, being able to keep infinity in the details and the, Keep an eye on details in the face of infinity. And fourthly, the power, the great power, power, say, of King David or something like that in the Western tradition, but in the Buddhist world, we say the power of Ashwapani. So this inner healing or spiritual healing, compassion, wisdom, and inner strength, inner power, inner confidence, uh, being very important, becomes a becomes ma, becomes a becomes a. Then runs a samugati soha. Runs the king of healing could mean the healing of enlightenment itself, the great healing, which is in, the king of healing, which is enlightenment itself. Until we become an enlightened being, we suffer from the poisons of the klesha, of anger, attachments, fear, aversion, and so on. So that's one, one kind of way of interpreting. Otherwise, healing from the, the 404 types of diseases <laughs> for the first four. Healing for the 101 types of diseases created by means that, that are, the karma is activated by either anger or irritation, the poisonous effect that that has on the body. Attachment and craving, craving, always feeling, I need something, I need something, I need something fills the body with a kind of poison brain chemistry, you could say, and throws the whole kitten caboodle out of kittedness and caboodledness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the 101 types of diseases caused by craving and a feeling of need, 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 not having enough, not the world not being enough, the world is not enough. <laughs> and then not understanding nature of self. The, all the negative energy that comes from the bewildered, lazy, befuddled, and confused mind. And fourthly, from the, the 101 types that come from just negative energy blockages. So shamanic Tibetan types would say that refers to ghosts. <laughs> mm. And non-shamanic types would say it's just energy blockages. And again, the fifth meaning, something like the great healing of enlightenment itself, the king of healing, which is enlightenment of itself. But however one does it, um, 
one doesn't really need to think much about the mantra. I think a lot of them doing mantra is in the, just the visualization at one's heart, the mantra and at the center of the heart, either a blue radiance or the medicine Buddha sitting there and thinking this is my natural healing power, my natural the ability of, of my own psychoneuro system to do completely perfect self-management. <laughs> Our immunity system should be able to heal anything. You know, with kids, even if they break a bone and you don't set it, just as so long as you put the bone in the right direction, the electromagnetic energy carries the cells of the bone back into the right place. Mm. So we have this kind of miraculous system which is like a self-healing mechanism. So once one of my friends said, oh yeah, you should go to the doctor more often, Glenn, because you know, you, you know, the doctor feels like a car if you don't check it up and get, uh, you know, get it healed. I pointed out, actually, I don't agree at all. The car can never fix itself. If you get a flat tire and you leave it in the backyard, that tire will never, ever, ever in a million years self-inflate. Or if you have a, broken drive or crankshaft <laughs> it'll never <laughs> fix itself but the body is in fact completely self-healing in almost all regards i mean not that it always will heal and everyone will die eventually but the idea in healing meditations like medicine buddha like emmy tyas like white tara and as you know kevin gilakran was very big on the white tara practice. Uh, he had a special lineage of that and often gave that empowerment. The idea is that we can make our body heal 90% of everything that it ever encounters. We only might have trouble with the other 10%. And uh, based on that, when I was in India, I delivered half a dozen babies because I heard that only one in 20 ever needs any help whatsoever. Otherwise, all you have to do is sit there and smile and say, no, dear, relax. Push a little bit. <laughs> wow. Out and take two pieces of the string, cut it off, sterilize the scissors a little bit, snip it, and then wait for the afterbirth to come out. And if you're in the Tibetan world, then after the afterbirth comes out, you go outside and bury it in a sacred place and plant a tree on top of it. So then whenever you see the tree, it'll sort of be the token tree of your child. Mm -hmm. And a, a Naga spirit, a nature spirit, will take up a residence, and it will be a lifetime protector of your child. Put mineral water? Yeah. Is that mineral water, Glenn? I can't read it. Ita Italian mineral water. Is it carbonated or uncarbonated? I always drink carbonated. I don't know what flat water doesn't agree with me. I'm not a very flat guy. Yeah, wow. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so the idea by doing medicine Buddha practice, um, we do, we can send out light from the medicine Buddha sitting at the center of our heart, or we can visualize in front and it comes in to us and comes in, absorbs and heals our body in various waves. Those kind of methods are there for for doing healing or we can put um, the medicine Buddha at the heart and the four healing goddesses in the four uh, other chakras, uh, crown, throat, navel, and sacred chakra, and do mantras and send light from those specific chakra points within the bodies to heal those specific aspects of the body, you could say, elements of the body, skandhas, could say skandhas and so on. So those kind of uh, practices are there. And how often is it recommended? Is, are, are the teachings that do they vary in how often you should practice or, or a certain amount of five minute session or 20 minute sessions or multiple as often as possible? Well, uh, I think most Tibetans will do some medicine Buddha mantras every day. And if anyone in their home is ill, or if they are ill, they might do a retreat for like a week or 10 days or two weeks and do intensive practice. But generally doing every day is considered 
with all of our practices to do at least uh, one or two minutes every day. You can do it when you're driving or when you're walking. You don't have to do in a formal sitting way. Although with our main practices, generally we do them seated on our meditation cushion in a meditation room in Tibet. A favorite meditation room was a nice cave at 15 or 16,000 feet altitude with a beautiful southern exposure and a little meadow outside. You would go out and sit and uh, between meditation sessions and look out over the valleys and the clouds. Mm. Then go back into your cave and meditate for another session for a couple hours, like that. But otherwise, I think uh, daily practice with any mantra is important because uh, a lot of the retreats using mantra and methods using mantra are called the uh, the approach approach, which means holding close. So when you do a practice, even for a little while every day, it's very close in your mindfulness and in your general life in, gen in general, I would say, and has a lot of uh, very great benefits like that. Whereas if you just do it once a year or something like that, you kind of lack the intimacy with it. And therefore it's not as effective. So most, a lot of initiations, so when you receive them, you will, in the old days, I'm a little different in the West because, you know, over here people don't really know what they're doing and it's all kind of a new stuff and it's a, sort of an experiment. But in, uh, in Asia, traditionally, when you received any empowerment, if it's medicine, Buddha, Tara, at a point when the mantra transmission is given, you will commit to doing a certain number of mantras every day. And usually the Lama will say, now, if you're taking this as an actual practice, initiation, actual transmission, then you should think 3, 7, 21, 108, or a complete, uh, like a thousand, something like that. How many you'll do every day until enlightenment. And most Tibetans will say 3, 7, or 21, because that's easy. They get up in the morning and usually they do a walk around the temple or the local valley to the sacred places for an hour and they do all their mantras at that time and I do the same in the evening uh, so traditionally in Tibet people would do say 7 or 21 and from the time of receiving empowerment until enlightenment they would continue with every initiation they have doing 7 or 21 a day minimum kind of thing and if your mom got ill or your brother or sister or something like that, or you're one of your kids, then you might do a what they call a yin tun, a full day retreat, dedicating that, directing that energy to them. So in the case of Medicine Buddha, Medicine Buddha at your heart, or if you did the initiation fully yourself as Medicine Buddha, hung at your heart, sending out lights, emanates out from the hung and from the mantra, becomes it becomes a ma, becomes it becomes a ranza samagadi soha, flows out to them and fills them and completely heals them. So it's kind of, you could say, a telekinesis, microwave cooking style of healing others. Tibetans do say, lamas do say generally, that if you have a close connection with someone, your ability to heal them will be as strong as your connection. So for instance, having the Dalai Lama do a healing for someone won't be as effective as having, the, having a child do that practice for their parents or a parent doing it for a child. The karmic connection makes a very strong impact. Of course, you know, if Dalai Lama does it for you, obviously it's a great honor and a great blessing. Yeah. And people do come and when they visit him and often Tibetans will hold up their baby and say, please blow a mantra on him, Ngak Purana. Mm. So Ngak is mantra and Pu is to blow. And Dalam will go, oh, <laughs> and just blow, visualizing the healing energies flowing from his heart and striking them and filling their body and completely healing them. Mm. But of course, every Tibetan has a very strong karmic connection with Dalai Lama, so maybe that's as good as or even better than their own parents or kids doing it, because who knows? Mm. Who knows who your parents really are? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Glenn, is there a reason that the Medicine Buddha is depicted as a deep blue? And, you know, I noticed that in, of course, in the Hindu tradition of Krishna, there seems to be a sect of these teachers and beings that are always being depicted as deep blue. Is that because they are referencing an actual different type of being that actually is blue? Um, you know, like another worldly type of a being? Well, I think, well, you know, these are all speculative. Any, anything I say or any Lama says about that is probably speculation and guesswork. My strength is that I always make perfect guesses. So when I don't like to buy a lotto ticket because then I always win the lotto and that deprives all those others of winning. So, But, uh, you know, Tantra in general talks about the five families of Buddhas, the white family of Varochana, the red family of Amitabha, the blue, dark blue family of Akshobhya, the golden yellow family of Ratnasambhava and the olive green, emerald green family of Amoga City. And sometimes these are linked, the same word used for them, rig, is used for caste and it's also used for race of humans. And the idea is that we all have five races within us all humans have traces of the five races in terms of castes we have potential of the five castes now in india there are four great castes but the fifth caste is you could you could say the non-caste or the outcast the uncast so i think a medicine but a deep blue has a couple of meanings one is going back to very very ancient times if it's an Indian culture, the you know the earlier peoples in India before the Aryan invasions of uh, four or five thousand years ago were uh, were uh, Negroid peoples, sort of a very dark race. And Tibetans think of that as kind of a blue. In the no, not Tibetans, but the Aryans in India thought of that as kind of a blue black, like a raven. It's black, but it's the sunlight hits it and you get a kind of a blueness on it. So that, that quality is there. So I think part of it is that it's connected to the very ancient tradition. Uh, so I, that's perhaps connected. The other is, you know, the shamanist tradition of Central Asia of the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. I can't remember the numbers, but it's like 50, 51 and 45, I think it is, or something like that. No, 40. Anyway, comes up to 99 peaceful and wrathful deities, some white, some black. And then at the center, there's a big blue guy, Ektengir, uh, who rules over them all. And so it's just yeah, like 45, I think, and 54, something like that, making 99. And Ektengir, the big blue cosmo cosmological force that rules over them all. So I think there might be some connection to that very ancient shamanic tradition of the sky and space representing the universal healing power. But otherwise, uh, in the modern Buddhist tradition, which means modern meaning the last uh, 2,000 years, <laughs> right. the blue represents space, and space represents the potential of all things. Space can give rise to anything. Space can become all things. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So I would say it represents the infinite potential of the element of space or the infinity factor, the infinite potential of the infinity factor. Yeah, so therefore Buddha Vajradhara is primordial. As primordial Buddha, Dume Sangye, 
<coughs> is always deep, dark blue like that. And in Yingma and Bunpo traditions, Samantabhadra, Paramayavigal Buddha, is always uh, dark blue. Sometimes painted a little bit lighter blue, because the darker you make it, the more difficult it is for artists to bring any sense of character. You know, if you paint something totally flat black, you don't get any sense of character whatsoever. If it's just flat black, you need to have tone. Same with white, if you paint something just plain white. Or any flat color, if you just paint it in a flat color, it becomes just characterless and you have to use like Manjushri, they'll, on the yellow, they'll throw in a little bit of orange and red to highlight it, or a white lotus flower, they'll highlight cavities in the flower, folds in the flower with a red or blue or something like that. But I think it represents the infinity, the infinite pebble that comes out of that infinity. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, we've got five more minutes. So finish. In five minutes, uh, then my, my last question is, um, you had said 2,000 years in Buddhism is basically modern times. And uh, when I was asking about the blue beings and are they a different type of being, I remember on an interview you did with um, Guru Viking podcast, you had made a passing comment that in Buddhism, the, the timeline is many hundreds of thousands of years of civilization, not a few thousand, not 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. That's also consistent with my understanding about Hindu uh, historical timelines. Could you speak to a little bit about the, the, the depth of, of, of Buddhist perspective on, on how deep civilization goes in terms of time? Like a civilization meaning uh, advanced uh, with technology, with, with humans with capacity far beyond fire making. Well, as Mahatma Gandhi would said when he was asked about uh, what he thought about Western civilization, he said it would be a good idea if they got some. <laughs> and I think, you know, every generation or every era, people always think that they're very advanced and very technological and so on. But I would say right now, now, you know, in Buddhism, we're in a Kali Yuga, a very dark age. We're like as uncivilized as humans have ever been in the history of the planet. We're in a very deep morose of anti-civilization, you could say. You know, if you look at our factory farms, spend a day in a factory farm, spend a day in a forest watching how humans humans harvest everything from the forest and consume it. Spend a day meditating in a landfill as the garbage is come and dumped. And watch all the garbage just wash out and float onto the shores. So right now, according to Buddhism, on a downward spiral in our terms of civilization, we're becoming a little bit less civilized <laughs> every century more barbaric every century. And I think, you know, if you look back at it, I think that's probably true. You know, when the Spanish landed in South America, they commented that they thought they had arrived in the Garden of Eden. They said everything's so wonderful, and so beautiful, and everyone's so relaxed and so easygoing, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I think, uh, yeah, our world is on a bit of a downward spiral, and that spiral tends to go up and down. It's neither a good thing nor a bad thing. Becoming better human beings is not necessarily better for the human beings alive at any given time. Life in Buddhism is a kind of a training ground for enlightenment. If you're born when things are too easy going and too smooth, you know, you're not inspired to make an effort to find out what the heck is all this the thing called life. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when there's some kind of strong challenge and people push a little bit further to find meaning. Otherwise, I think today, if you look at a thousand being humans, 
probably less than one out of a thousand actually search for the meaning of life. They just get up in the morning and have their coffee and go to work and, you know, pay the bills and build their stock portfolio for their plan for the retirement. And <laughs> they just sort of live hand to mouth toward the day of retirement and hope their kids kind of go that way. And, uh, so calling it, as Mahatma Gandhi put, a civilization is a little bit of a, un, a little bit of an overly flattering term. Mm. <laughs> Not just, you know, our Western civilization, all civilizations. I think if you look at China today and how the barbaric nature of life in China, how many people are in prison, organ harvesting by the government, for sale internationally. I had a bad liver. I'd fly some prison with my blood type. That would be it. I'd get half his liver wow. <laughs> or a kidney or whatever. Wow. You know, we, and we look at how, how they treat most of their citizens and, uh, you know, you look at uh, how they treat Muslims, how they treat Tibetans, how they treat any minorities, anyone who doesn't like communism. We can very clearly see that Chinese civilization 3,000 years ago was much higher than it is today. If we look at the algebra and geometry being practiced in Persia 3,000 years ago, and we look how dumb most Iranians are in comparison. I mean, there's, there are still very smart people, Iranians, some of the smartest people on our planet, but how intellectually challenged they are today compared to 3,000 years ago when they could sit down with a pencil and run through algebra and geometry without a without so much as like uh, taking a pee break. <laughs> mm. So, you know, I think, and we look at North American natives, I mean, 5,000 years ago, the Hopi and the Aslatas and many of these great nations were doing wonderfully. And today, you know, mostly they're living on reservations on mm. government stipends and their biggest problems are alcoholism and drug addiction. So in the Buddhist world, we go up and down through the cycles of darkness and light. And right now we're on the downward spiral of a period of darkness. And we'll have occasional little flips going up or down a little bit, but we're on a generally a downward spiral. And according to the Buddhist prophecy, it'll come down to where your average lifespan of a human will be 10 years. We'll live for 10 years. It doesn't mean your average human's gonna die at age 11, but it means out of 100 people who are born, some will die in the womb, some will die coming out, some will die in childhood, some will live to 100 or so. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when it comes down like that, then it turns around and people suddenly get the message, yeah, yeah, we better not be such barbarians using the environment <laughs> like this and misusing sources like this and just looking upon Consume, consumering objects of the senses as the be all and end all of uh, life on this little planet. Mm -hmm. And we'll get that message and turn around and go the other way. And civilization will come back and in Christianity, then the Christ will reappear and the dead will rise up, which for me is not a metaphor that we all go to heaven if you're a Christian and you go to hell if you're not. It means civilization will once again become uh, move into an enlightenment or a sensible or whatever we want to call it way of relating with the earth and with the elements and with each other as human beings and with the species and so on. I mean, just the way we farm, even you know, if we can say, well, I don't like the factory farm, so I'm going to be a vegetarian, even the kind of pesticides and insecticides and poison thrown onto the earth just to grow a tomato. It seems, you know, I mean, a lot of places you can't drink the water because just the runoff from the farms, if you're a remote country, just the runoff from the farms of <laughs> chemical yeah. pollutants used as fertilizer poisons the water. And this, uh, and you know, look what we're doing with fracking, you know, sucking up all of the stuff under the earth. So now Oklahoma has like three earthquakes a month or something as the earth kind of settles back in from all of this pressure we sucked out. It's like pulling the air out of a balloon. And yeah, scientists can say, well, there's very little 
compared to the volume of the earth. Well, yeah, it might be, but it's right under where your high rise building is standing. That's <laughs> sure. going from there into your water supply and into your water supply, into your rivers and into your rivers, into your oceans. So, uh, in the Buddhist thing, we're spiraling downward for the last, uh, I don't know, several thousand years <laughs> with an occasional upward flow. <laughs> so, we say Buddha was born at a time when the spiral was still going down and it'll go down for another thousand or so years. Some people put the date as 2364 by the Christian era, but who knows? <laughs> Buddhists have never been ter terribly good at mathematics. So, But I think yeah, in the, no, in the Buddhist world, we should do what we can to stand up for those principles we believe are important. So there is a some sort of, you could say, element of social activism. At the same time, we should do so without any great hysteria, understanding that cycles have their own process of unfoldment. We can put our input, and we should put our input, but we shouldn't be overly confident that what we, how we want things to go is how they will go. But in the Buddhist world, yeah, Buddha was the fourth of the 1,000 universal teachers of this era, each of whom will live for 5,000 years and with a couple of thousand years in between each one. So we got a long way to go, baby, before this human race disappears into the dust and the mud and comes back as rats and cockroaches. <laughs> but, you know, the next thousand years are a challenge and the next hundred are a definite challenge. According to the Kala Chakra prophecy, if we can make it to the threshold, the tipping point going in a positive way, we'll have a real by a thousand years of good human life, we go downhill again. So things spiraling down right now, but if we hit that tipping point where the forces of goodness and intelligence come in, we'll start spiraling up and have a thousand years of an upward spiral. And uh, one of my books is The Practice of Color Chakra. So that's from the Color Chakra Tantra. I'll put a prophecy in the Color Chakra Tantra. So I try and sell that theory on the basis it'll make some people buy a copy of that book and I'll get the royalties. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So ben, thank you so much. That's okay. Oh yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna hit uh, stop on the recording. Thank you, thank you.